Well, here now in the studio are Professor Paul Arthur from the University of Ulster and Colin McDevitt, the former Director of Communications for the STLP and now Director of Weber Shandwick, Managing Director. Colin McDevitt, I'll start with you. I know you've been active tonight in the social network Twitter and you've been pondering on whether Senator Kennedy um, helped to transform Irish nationalism in the um, 70s and 80s. And what's your conclusion? I think he did. I think uh, a partnership of Kennedy, John Hume, and the STLP and progressive thinkers and officials and politicians in the Republic of Ireland really entirely shifted the axis of Irish nationalism during the 70s and the 80s. They moved it from being basically anti-British uh, and pro-violence in some form or another to being one that recognised a really complex set of relationships, the relationships that ultimately led uh, to the Good Friday Agreement. They're the people who let unionism into the political club that was Irish nationalism and that allowed discourse to take place not on the basis of a victory but on the basis of a, of a lasting consensus and that's of course what we live in today. You see talking to Neil O'Dyed earlier on there I was kind of getting the, the impression that there are many Irish Americans who would be happy to confer sainthood on, it, on him but I'm sure there are many unionists who wouldn't certainly in the early days wouldn't have seen it like that. No but I think it's worthwhile bearing in mind you know as early as 1977 Ted Kennedy made a speech in the Senate in which he embraced the uh, Ulster Irish and he said that their contribution to the whole foundation of the United States had to be taken on board. So from that date he was thinking very carefully about unionism and in fact in early 1978 Andy Turry, who then the Supreme Commander of the UDA, spoke about his credibility and integrity and a man who could be a very good mediator mm -hmm. on a peace forum. So you know, let's not just see it as something that happened in the 90s. He was always, he was always thinking always ahead. He's always doing that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, did, did he uh, mellow his views as, as he got older? I think um, Sir Reg Empey referred to him there as becoming a bit more, more balanced in, in his, his approach. Connell? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know that he really mellowed. I think, I think a lot of unionists look back to a visit he made to Ireland in 1970, at the, really at the dawn of the Troubles, mm -hmm. and the anger I think he reflected in himself, seeing the country he loved being so, so torn, torn apart. But I think his message from day one was that people should live for Ireland and for a better Ireland. And I think he rejected anyone who ever said that anyone should kill for Ireland. I mean, he himself had lost not two, but three brothers mm -hmm. to violence, yeah. one in war, and two, to the, to, the, to the hand of assassins. This was a man who found it, I think, extremely difficult to reconcile that anyone would do anything in the name of the country he loved and use a gun to do that. You were talking there about a visit that he made to Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, yeah. of course, in the 70s. I thought, thought it was interesting that for such a, an interest that he had in Northern Ireland, he didn't actually visit here until 1998 or something? 1998 was when he first came to Northern Ireland. Part of that was particularly because his brothers had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. It was always considered to be dangerous territory for him to come up to. But he was always on the ball. I mean, I first met him in November 1980, uh, when a couple of us had a bit an hour with him, and he was totally on top of what was going on in Northern Ireland. He was a wonderful listener, and he always made sure he'd got the top-class staffers around him who would give him the best possible advice. So he was always thoughtful, he was always inclusive, and it was, how do we move this process forward? So politically impressive, you find him. And Connell, yeah. you would have had dealings with him as well during the John Hume era. You yeah. find the same? Yeah, I mean, he was a man yeah. of quiet charisma, I guess, yeah. Yeah. but uh, deep sort of conviction to policy. One of the things that's really interesting about him, Mark Durkin re recollected it this morning, was that he was really committed to doing the best job he could possibly do as a legislator. And a lot of times we lose this in this world of so-called spin and media and all that sort of stuff. He just wanted to speak out for those people who were voiceless. And in many cases in the US Senate, those were the people of Ireland, mm -hmm. be they unionist or nationalist. Uh, just an interesting observation to finish with. I mean, from, from my experience, you know, if you talk to people who kind of grew up in the 50s and 60s, uh, the Kennedys were almost, for um, people from Ireland, they were almost the, the equivalent of today's public fixation with that celebrity status. Yeah. Wouldn't that be yeah. right? Oh, I think that was <coughs> uh, very much the case. But interestingly, in that period, the Kennedys didn't show any great uh, interest in Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, Ted Kennedy's father had been U.S. ambassador to uh, uh, the court of St. James at the outset of the Second World War, and he was seen to be anti-British, uh, but certainly not because he was pro-Irish, but because he thought the British were going to lose the Second World War. Interesting observations from uh, Paul Arthur and Conal McDevitt. Thank you both very much indeed for uh, joining us tonight.